Thank you, Nicola. Thank you. Point. Well, thank you for the invitation uh, to be here. Um, uh, this is actually my first time to EPFL, so um, it's uh, it's really a, after all these years I never made it here. So, but then when I come here, I, re I realize there are so many familiar faces uh, that I see here. So many of us have crossed paths uh, somewhere. So what I want to do today is. Um, uh, this is not a very technical talk, there's some technical things towards the end, but, but show you how we sort of, how we think about the materials, genome, where we are, and then towards the latter half of my talk where I think we should go uh, next in, in quite general terms. So um, I am actually a metallurgist by training. Uh, for my undergraduate I did uh, what they call heat and beat metallurgy, if that term uh, means something to you. Uh, uh, no theory involved at all at the time. Now it's gotten much better. And so uh, I have a frustration with classic material science. Um, the, the typical thing that happens, you know, materials are very complex, right? And, and those of you who've done experimental work know that. And uh, typically what happens is that uh, we see some strange observation in materials which um, we, we don't really understand. So we, come, we have a standard set of explanations um, or, or I would call them excuses. So uh, if you don't understand it first, it must be defects, right? Because in the end, we always know very little about the defects, so it's a great excuse to make um, when we don't understand something. Um, uh, if defects is not what you want to use as an excuse, then, then uh, what else do we use? Uh, we'll call it kinetics, right? Because kinetics does magical things which we cannot understand through thermodynamics or electronic structure and so again because we don't have much of good predictive quantitative kinetic theories we can sort of explain everything with it right um, and then later of course um, more sophisticated explanations came about if there was something we didn't understand uh, we called it nano right if it was on small particles even if it had nothing to do with small particles we sometimes called it nano even if it had uh, nothing to do with it and I think in part this is because um, about a lot of compounds we have an enormous lack of quantitative information. Um, I'd like to quote these numbers. If you look at the world of inorganic chemistry, which I limit myself to, the world of organic chemistry is much larger. Um, the world of inorganic chemistry has about somewhere in the range of 50,000 to 200,000 known compounds, depending on how you count. Uh, you can make extrapolations of how many unknown there might be, but it's probably of that order of magnitude. So you're in the range 10 to the fifth sort of uh, number of compounds. If you look at classic properties of how much do we know about these compounds, right? You take something like the elastic constant tensor, not just the Young's model. Uh, we actually know that for about 200 compounds out of the, say, 100,000, right? And this is sort of basic property uh, that we know very little about. Um, Superconductivity is one of the best characterized properties because there was such a gold rush for looking for superconductors. We know TC for about a thousand uh, compounds. But you look at stuff like the dielectric constants, uh, typically we know that for several hundred compounds. Again, most compounds we know uh, nothing about. I'll show you some work on piezoelectrics, the full tensor, right? Not just one of the coefficients. We know experimentally for about 50 compounds, the full uh, piezoelectric tensor. Um, so for almost every property that I would say sort of a basic intrinsic materials property, not an engineering property, uh, we are well below 1% in coverage, which means most compounds we don't actually know anything about. So we don't actually have to invent new compounds per se to find interesting things. We just don't know anything about uh, most existing compounds. So I want to put you in a world where you imagine that you actually knew a lot more, right? Imagine that you knew for every compound the band gap, the effective masses, the Zeebeck coefficient, uh, all these electronic properties. You would know the elastic constants, the electric constants, absorption spectra. Let's say you knew all these things, right? Maybe you also would know the point defect energies, right? You would know solubilities of things in other phases. Uh, you would know the electronic signature of those defects, right? Maybe if you're more into mechanical behavior, you'd want to know the stacking fault energy. You'd want to know the perils barrier of these locations. You'd want to know the solute interaction with a dislocation. Maybe you want to know the surface energies. Imagine that you would know all these things, right? Where, where would material science be? And first of all, you could do, if you were looking at new compounds, you would do a sort of very, a much better pre-selection, right? When you look, let's say you're screening for photocatalysts. 
or for thermoelectrics, you would do a much better pre-screening already <coughs> when you work on new compounds. But more importantly, you know, these intrinsic compound properties that I've mentioned there, I mean, these are of course not the engineering properties that one is often after in applications, but if you had that basic input, you could probably in a, in a much more quantitative way build higher length scale theories. And so that was, the, that was the idea we had when we sort of started naming the materials genome, that a lot of these properties, actually that whole list of properties that I showed you, all, every single one of them is computable today. Every single one has been computed many times in papers. We just haven't done it on a large amount of compounds. So, so that dream that I portrayed to you is really not that hard. We kind of have the technology uh, and actually the scientific understanding largely to do it today. And that was our idea of the materials genome. That's why we called it the genome because we think of these intrinsic properties sort of as the genes of compounds. And that's what we started to do in the materials project, which is now led by Christian Pearson, who's also here at uh, EPFL uh, today, but uh, at another workshop, um, that we would try by what's called high throughput computing, essentially automating well-known techniques and scale them across the universe of these known compounds, you know, 100,000 compounds, basically compute all these things. If you have a method to compute energy, compute the energy of everything. If you have a method to compute band gap, compute the band gap of everything. And that is the idea of the Materials Project. So the Materials Project today is essentially funded by the Department of Energy. It's a consortia between a lot of universities and national labs. Uh, but really, it's actually only a $2 million center at its core. Uh, but what it has done, it has, has, has built interaction with many other large centers in the United States and, and has become much larger through that. So today in the materials, if you look in the materials project, there are over 66,000 compounds, over a million prop calculated uh, property values. And like I said, it's, it's essentially become the computer data hub for large centers like the solar hub in the United States, uh, the battery hub, Jay Caesar, uh, the, the hub on metastability, uh, and some other organizations. So I'm only going to briefly talk a little bit about what's in there because I want to talk about what we, what's really sort of the next challenge after that. But our approach has been to invest in property calculation from which we can leverage a lot of behavior, right? So for example, if you calculate energy well, you can sort of do ground state phase diagrams, you can calculate the reaction energies, uh, and actually we could even do battery voltages because battery voltages are essentially energetics of reactions, right? So we, we spend a lot of time uh, figuring out how to combine multiple functionals so that we could work in different chemical domains with high accuracy, but still integrate that. Uh, and build essentially the largest database of, of, of thermochemistry now, of, of actually calculated uh, formation enthalpies. Similarly, we did band structures, not quite for the whole data set, and that then leads through to band gaps, uh, Zbeck coefficients, uh, effective masses, uh, and some people are trying to use this for uh, optical spectra. Uh, more recently, we've gotten into sort of the tensor properties, and uh, the materials uh, project last year launched the largest set of calculated full uh, elastic tensors. This is up to a, a bit over 2,000. Um, and you can actually sort of uh, pull them all out of the um, uh, materials project. You can do some very basic polycrystalline averaging in the materials project. And most people actually pull the data and do sort of their uh, offline uh, work with it. Uh, very recently, uh, piezoelectric data was uh, published uh, on about 1,000 systems, the full tensor. Uh, and, and that actually, interestingly, brought out some really interesting compounds that may have large piezoelectric coefficients um, that people didn't really look at because they were not perovskite, right? And a lot of the piezoelectric literature has focused on perovskite. And these are currently, uh, there's currently work on the way to actually synthesis and testing in another collaboration uh, we have. Uh, dielectric tensor is coming soon. This is not online yet, and, and this, uh, the properties then that follow from the dielectric concert, the tensor. Um, we have used this for materials discovery, but, but the most interesting thing is that other people use this. That was really our idea, that we would make this data available and other people would do creative things with it. And you know, the list is sort of interesting. Uh, I was like, uh, there's a guy who works on outer space cement with our data. Um, and I still really haven't fully read the paper, but he gets all the data out of the materials project. Uh, there was a novel oxide light absorber that was discovered out of the materials project, uh, a new thermoelectric, and these are both <laughs> materials that have been made. Um, 
like I said, the data is freely available. You can go on the website but, uh, and, and just play with it, pull data. But a lot of people pull data in high throughput mode uh, through uh, an API, which is an advanced programming interface uh, through HTTP commands. And, and I think every three months we deliver something like five million uh, pieces of data uh, on average. So um, when we built this originally, we had no idea if this would, if people would come and, and if this would be used. Um, Today the Materials Project has almost 17,000 registered users. Uh, it generates about 20 new users a day. But maybe the most important thing is that um, we have 400 users actively using the site every day. That means they spend more than five or 10 minutes. So these are not just people who register, these are actually people who do and who work uh, uh, with the data showing that there's a need for it. And we see more and more uh, use in the literature of data out of uh, the Materials Project. So I'm gonna show you um, quickly one or two examples of use and then go on to sort of uh, some of the next uh, challenges. So um, there's many things you can do if you bring data back uh, all together in one place, I have found. Uh, the materials project uh, houses mainly computer data, but actually houses some uh, high quality experimental data, and we often leverage back and forth between the two. But I'm going to show you one particular project that I was involved with. Uh, what you can do when you have a lot of crystal structure information coupled to chemistry and thermochemistry. And so, uh, what I wanted to use this data for is to essentially learn have a computer learn chemical similarity. Now chemical similarity has to be with respect to a metric, right? If I say when two elements are similar, is that for some particular chemistry? So what I was interested in is how similar are they with respect to making the same crystal structures, right? Because I wanted to in the end build a crystal structure prediction a tool out of that. And if you have a lot of data, you can do that, right? We also know intuition, things that are near each other in the periodic table, right? We think of those as making similar crystal structures. But we wanted to see if we could code this, have a computer learn this so that it would be without bias, right? Okay, and here is this, here's the idea of it. Let's say you observe two compounds, right? A2B306 and A2C306. And let's say they have the same, and you find them with the same crystal structure. So you find a pair of different chemistry with the same crystal structure. That is teaching you something, right? We may not know what it teaches, but it teaches you that there's clearly some substitution ability of B by C retaining the crystal structure, right? So the question is, can we extract these substitution rules in an automated way? Similarly, I, I wrote down a bunch of manganese-based spinels here. There's a cadmium one, a zinc one, a magnesium one. They all have the same structure. It's actually a tetragonal spinel. So obviously you will learn from that that you know, cadmium and zinc interchange for each other. No surprise right there. Same column of the product table, but also magnesium interchanges uh, for that. So we can either sort of like think of all these as nuggets in our head, but the question is can I make a mathematical model that captures that and captures the strength of that similarity? So here's how we do that. We essentially, like in all data mining, right, what we do is we write a probability density that, that two chemistries have the same crystal structure in terms of exponentials of feature functions, uh, is what they're called. Um, Fi is essentially one or zero, uh, depending whether you have a mapping of the composition. But what you really want is to know uh, what lambda i is, which is essentially the strength of a substitution and the strength that, it that is a measure by which that substitution will not change the crystal structure. And then, like in any uh, good data mining, what you really do is you take that probability density that you write out and you fit it in a sort of maximum entropy way to the data. So what you, want, what you want is I have a probability function. I want it to represent the data that I have, which is, say, the international uh, database of crystal structures, but no more, right? So a maximum entropy uh, idea. And here's what you get. So you get this matrix of substitution ability. So basically most of the periodic table is sort of on one end. We do this by ions, not just by atoms, right? Because we are very interested in ionic compounds. Uh, and then the, the periodic table is kind of here again. Uh, because there's so many elements, they're listed here and here. There's, this is a different listed. That's always the space in between. So reddish color means, and, and yellow color means high substitutional probability. Blue means they really don't substitute for each other. Okay. Chemistry 101 here now, of course. This is exam time. This 
red, red block, barium, calcium, strontium-2. No surprise, right? We knew this, right? These substitute really well, like you look at perovskite, for example, these substitute are crazy. But it's great, right? The computer finds this. <coughs> okay, what do you think this block is? We you probably can read it, right? This works much better if I'm in a big auditorium and you can't actually read the labels. But this is yellow, right? High substitution ability. That's the lanthanides. Again, we know that the lanthanides substitute well for each other when they're in the, the same 3 plus retaining the crystal structure. Then you sort of see a weaker block with quite a bit of variation. That's actually the transition metals. And again, the transition metals, we know a lot of them substitute for each other, but a lot of them don't. Right? So it's not nearly as strong an effect as the lanthanides and the, uh, and the alkali earths here. So how is this useful? Well, it's useful because I can invert the structure problem. For those of you who are not familiar, the structure problem is essentially one that we've all tried to solve for the longest time. You give me the composition, I give you the crystal structure, right? Many methods to do this, very few methods that work really well all the time. So we invert this problem. We start from known compounds, and the question is, how can I change their chemistry, keeping the structure the same, right? So I use these structure substitution rule, these chemistry substitution rules to start with compounds and make novel compounds out of them. And because this is a data mining algorithm, this is essentially a probabilistic algorithm, right? So if I change the chemistry, it's going to give me a list, a ranked list of 10, 20, 100 compounds where say, most likely this crystal structure, second most likely that, third most likely. And that's exactly what I need because if you have a short list of structures, then you can just do ab initio calculations on them, right? If I have 20 structures, I just calculate them with density functional theory and I pick out the one uh, with the lowest energy. So data mining is here used as a sort of knowledge method, right? It's a knowledge method. It's, it's one that replaces intuition, right? A good solid state chemist sort of looks at the chemistry. It might be this, it might be that, right? This is sort of an automated data mining algorithm to do this. So I'm going to show you uh, some things that we've done uh, with this. Uh, this one is quite a long time ago. Uh, this is a compound that uh, literally the computer invented for us. It's a lithium vanadium double phosphate. Uh, it came from a simple substitution, but all we had told the algorithm to look for uh, phosphates with vanadium in because we like the double redox couple. Vanadium can be 3 plus, 4 plus, 5 plus, which is great for those of us who make battery materials because you have double redox on it, right? And the phosphate groups give high thermal stability because the oxygen is strongly bonded to the phosphorus, which gives you safety. That was a simple substitution. This compound was not known. There was an iron compound known. And the computer just says, you know, we have a lot of iron vanadium substitution, so pr it predicts that. Then you do calculations on it and you find that indeed stable has a fairly complicated crystal structure, but when you make it in the lab, and, and, and the funny story, it's actually the same student who did the, the, the theory, who was so excited he went to do it in the lab, uh, agrees uh, extremely well. So the observed and the calculated diffraction pattern are essentially in perfect agreement, and it actually works. Uh, this is actually the calculated charge and discharge in a lithium battery, and the, the black and the, the gray line are the measured ones. There's reasonably good agreement, there's not perfect. So this is in some sense, a computer that searched for a battery material and largely found it right with these substitution rules. We can do double substitutions. Uh, we made these lithium carbonophosphates. These are rare chemistries, right? Carbonate and phosphate groups rarely combine in nature. They actually never combine with lithium. Uh, there are no stable known lithium containing carbonophosphates. Um, the computer came up with them by doing double substitution on a rare mineral, a sodium carbonophos manganese carbonophosphate, which is called siderenkite, where the manganese is replaced by the iron, sodium, by lithium. And so we made now many transition metal versions of this. They all have these beautiful colors, and they also work respectably well uh, as a battery material. So in some sense, you could, when you see these examples, you probably go, yeah, you know, I'm a good chemist. I, I could have figured out that sodium would be replaced by lithium and manganese by iron. But I think the point is that, first of all, you can now do it in a mathematically weighted sense, right? When you have your intuition, you really don't know, is this like 50% of the time true? Is this like 20% of the time true? It's now sort of a, a mathematically rigorous way of doing uh, the substitution. So this is some examples of what we do with high throughput computing uh, and having lots of data available. But the last part of my talk, I want to talk about what sort of preoccupies me lately, which is if you project where we are going to end up, right? Um, I, I've always strongly believed in the power of theory. And what we have now is that when somebody comes up with a new theory method or an, in, or an insight, right? 
Because the way it kind of goes is you have insight and somebody builds a theory method to predict it. And now there's a third piece is that we can scale that computation. You know, we can scale that computation to 10,000, 100,000 compounds in many cases. So once you figure it out, we'll now scale it across the known inorganic universe. So we're going to end up in a world where anything you dream up, you're going to know a lot of the properties ahead of time, right? And this is not true today. But I think what we are starting to see more and more as a challenge is that we don't really know what domain to optimize over. We don't really know the domain of materials that can be made, right? And this is a, a common problem in the theory literature. There have been many interesting predictions made on materials that are completely unmakeable. Completely, you know. Uh, this is getting better slowly, but if you look at the literature of the 80s and the 90s, there are some really like, you know, looks like fascinating predictions. And if you actually, by what we understand now, they were completely crazy. They were completely crazy. So the question is, how do you know what can be synthesized, right? Is there rules about that? And you know, at first what I did is I went to talk to some really good solid state chemists. Um, and I thought, these were people who had made a lot of compounds, and I thought I was going to learn the magic. Right? I, I, I asked them really, if I come up with a chemistry, how would you figure out how to make it? And what I learned is that A, they had a lot of experience. A lot of it was intuition. And two, they were extremely efficient in the lab. They had like many things going on at the same time, but there was no magic. And that was so disappointing. Okay, so um, I'm going to sort of show you a hint of how we may think about this. And you know, before you shoot this down as, you know, the synthesis problem is really hard, right? Let me be clear about this. So we are gonna carve out a really small piece to start with, and because I think that's how you have success in science. So, so um, what we're focusing is, is on polymorphism and metastability. So how can you decide when a metastable polymorph can be made? So that's one that's not the ground state, and how can it be made, right? So, Theorists use energy as a criteria. That's the only one we have today. So we do calculations, and if I like 10 crystal structures at a composition, the lowest one's the ground state, and then I kind of usually go, and everybody does this, right? Ah, oh, you know, it's only 20 milli electron volt above the ground state. I'm sure that a good chemist can make this, right? Uh, what if it's 75 milli electron volt per atom above the ground state? You know, that's like uh, 75 kilojoules, sorry, 7.5 kilojoules. Can they still make that? Well, we'll see, right? So that's all we have today. And you know, I'll show you, it's not bad, but it's not great either. So the question is, is energy a good criterion of what can be made? Well, for the first time, I think we have a quantitative way of evaluating that. Because we have a ton of observations. We have 100,000 observations sitting in the inorganic crystal structure database. You have to filter <laughs> them a little bit, and I'll come to that. Not everything in the database is quite right. And, and then we have a lot of thermochemical data for the first time calculated. We have phase diagrams calculated for 100,000 systems, right? ground state phase diagram. So I can start to map this onto that now and see what is the energy scale of what I um, have observed. And rough finding, and there's a lot of subtlety, this is a talk by itself, about 50% of the things observed, and this is crystalline compounds, right? let's be clear, is metastable about 50%. That's kind of actually what most of us would have guessed. It's not 5%, it's also not 99%. <coughs> but I'm gonna spar uh, slice this data a little more. I'm gonna show you, so we've done this across all chemistries. I'm gonna show you an example of oxides. So first, this is binary oxides. This is the frequency by which you find compounds with a certain energy above the ground state. So zero, does, that means those are ground states. Uh, and then, you know, like there are some that are 100 MeV per atom. 100 MeV is 10 kilojoules for those of you who think in different ways. Um, but let me show you the tail. This is color code. If you just take the database, um, the, the, the sort of light green things in the database, um, these are not sort of really crystalline unit cells. These are like defect unit cells that have been put in the database. So they form the higher tail. They're not really polymorphs, right? Uh, the light blue ones are high pressure phases, which are often not retained at low pressure. Uh, and this is interesting, the orange one uh, is actually theorists supplied structures in the database. So uh, <coughs> theorists have actually entered structures in the, inter in, the, in the inorganic crystal structure base, which in many cases have not been verified. That doesn't mean they're wrong, but I cannot use them as a data point of experimental observation. So if you remove all that, you end up with the dark blue. And what you see, is that's a, a very nicely decreasing histogram where kind of like most stuff is, 
in a range of like 100 milli electron volt per atom. Again, 10 kilojoules per mole of atoms here, right? Now, again, this is for inorganic compounds, right? Those of you who work, say, on carbon chemistry, if you did this for like carbon containing materials, this tail is a lot larger, right? Like a buckyball, I think a buckyball is like six, 700 milli electron volt above graphite, the ground state. And because the carbon chemistry is a bit unusual, it makes extremely strong uh, bonds. But here's this by chemistry that we looked at. So this is the fraction of compounds um, that you cover if you go a certain energy above the ground state, right? So it's the integral of an histogram. So if you're 50 milli electron volt per atom of the ground state, you sort of cover in many cases 70-80% uh, of the compounds. And this is per chemistry. You know, phosphides, sulfides, chlorides. And there are two that start to jump out. Uh, green is fluorides, and then this is nitrides. And so what does this tell you? That nitrides have much higher metastability than, than these other sort of semi-ionic ionic and semi-ionic materials. Because nitrides, to get, say, even to 50%, you have to go up to a much higher energy above the ground state. Um, we have dissected this in a lot of detail and have found parts of the answer to this. Why this? I'm going to show you parts of it, but we have not fully grasped this, right? But I'm going to show you part of this. Uh, so the other thing is, does this correlate to the cohesive energy? So this is the range, this is sort of the, the, the average uh, metastability, and then this is uh, plus and minus one sigma. Uh, and this is the lattice cohesive energy, or the cohesive energy. There is some correlation, right? If you have deeper cohesive energy, more negative cohesive energy, um, you sort of tend to get a little more metastability, though I say the correlation is not great. Right? You, this is one of these plots that if I try to convince you of the opposite, I probably could do that too. Okay, so the nitrites one we've put in production here in a team that we work with the National Renewable Energy Lab um, because we understand where at least part of the high metastability comes from. It turns out nitrites you can often make with an, what I would say a, a, a chemical source that produces atomic nitrogen rather than N2. And remember, N2 is the ground state. And one way is you can sputter in, an, in a nitrogen plasma with nitrogen atoms. You can work with ammonia precursors that give, uh, you, that give of nitrogen. Uh, and then you can actually make nitrites that are highly metastable with respect to release on the N2 gas. And recently, this team actually made, uh, this is actually uh, done in sputtering, uh, a highly metastable Cu3N phase. So this is a highly oxidized copper in a nitrogen environment, right? Copper 3 plus is really hard to get in with oxygen, actually. And this is essentially, um, um, uh, sorry, this is copper 1 plus. Uh, but this is a highly metastable nitrite, which you can only get um, uh, in sputtering reactions. And you see you start to get it when you get, when the target substrate distance in the sputtering chamber becomes, becomes smaller, because that makes the atomic nitrogen potential go up, because there is less recombination. Uh, to the nitrogen gas. So because nitrites are technologically so important, we've started a whole search for metastable nitrites doing exactly the same methodology, substitution algorithms from that predict new nitrites, which we then calculate. And I'll show you sort of an example of this. This is not technologically relevant, which is why I can show it to you at this point. Like this is chromium nitrites, right? Chromium here, nitrogen here. This is fraction of nitrogen. And so if you plot the formation energy versus nitrogen gas, the last nitrite you get is CRN, chromium nitrite, the chromium 3 plus nitrite. If you actually can go to a sputtering condition where you produce atomic-like nitrogen, we now know from calibration that that can be as much as one electron volt above N2. So now your, 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 the end of your axis is about here, which means your convex hull lives here, and in principle you should make these higher nitrogen composition nitrites, right? And so we have done this now for all binaries and all ternaries. And so we're sitting on a large set of several hundred potential uh, metastable nitrites that we should be able to make in high nitrogen chemical potential conditions. So the next step is to screen these for interesting properties, right? A lot of these have about the right band gaps for interesting uh, optical properties and, and work through them. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to what the data tells us, right? We can actually now look, when things are metastable, what are they metastable against? In some sense, what is the composition? So one way is polymorphism, right? Polymorphism means if this is, a, say, a ternary Gibbs triangle, you're metastable with respect to something with the same composition. There's a crystal structure with lower energy, 
The other form of metastability that you care about in compounds is metastability against phase separation into other compounds. So let's say you're here, you want to try to make a target here. If this actually were the phase diagram, you'd phase separate into this, this, and that. So now we can quantify how much of nature is stable with respect to polymorphism versus phase separation. And we do this by the number of components. So this is a complicated graph, so I'm, I'm just going to walk you through it. Um, what this shows you for uh, everything except the allotrope, so these are elements, right? This shows you two curves, essentially two histograms of uh, the, the fraction of compounds that are metastable as a function of the energy of the ground state. The outer dark line is always the compounds that are metastable with respect to phase separation. The lower curve, the lighter one, is the ones that are stable with respect to polymorphism. And this is binaries, ternaries, quaternaries, pentaneries. So there's a few observations you can make here, right? Polymorphism always has a lower metastability scale than phase separation. So if your metastability is against other compounds that are composition, you can push a higher energy scale. It's not a lot, but you can clearly push a higher energy scale. Does that make sense? I can rationalize that. I could have probably rationalized the opposite too. But you know, you actually need a, a certain amount of diffusion, right, to, to, be, uh, to form actually the, the stable compounds when they're at different composition. But there are other things. As the number of components increases, this one I wouldn't have guessed, the energy scale of metastability mostly goes down, except in the pentaries, which I still don't understand. So mainly, actually, if you look at polymorphism, it's about 10 here, about 7 here, 3 and a half, and here it's virtually non-existent in the pentaries. So if we are correct, then it's actually harder to be polymorphically instability when you have a lot of compounds. Okay. Um, Pauling said the same thing, basically, right? He, for other reasons, but if you read the, the Pauling rules, he basically sort of argued something of that nature, um, which is what he calls the law of parsimony. Uh, the other thing is that if you look at the area under the curve, when you go to higher number of components, there is almost no polymorphism. Almost everything that's metastable is metastable with respect to phase separation in lower and lower number compounds. So it's very hard to make a metastable compound with five components when it's not the ground state. <coughs> and that's exactly what Pauling said. That is actually exactly the law of parsimony. That he says that if you try to put a lot of things together, he was worried about oxides, he said they will ultimately segregate into less frustrated structures uh, with less number uh, of compounds. We are still struggling with exactly how to understand this data, but this is at this point what the data tells us. So, you think the news is good, so I've shown you that a lot of metastability lives at low energy. The question is, is low energy enough to be stable? If it were, then we're golden, right? Then the theorists just do their job, they calculate the, the energy, and then we hand it over to these great experiments, and you should be able to make it. But here's the bad news. So I took some very well-known systems, things like TiO2, zinc oxide, things that are really well studied. This is the energy scale of the known polymorphs. And you see roughly 100 MeV is kind of like, you know, where you are, 10 kilojoules. Okay, so now I tell my computer to make up a bunch of crystal structures, right? With the same <laughs> composition, but I, I do them by other prototypes. And that's the red curse. So the red points are other crystal structures, the energy of them, that have never been observed. And so we have a problem now, right? Because don't tell me that TiO2 hasn't been well studied, right? I mean, don't tell me that we're going to find 10 more polymorphs of TiO2 when we do our job better, right? Serious? The same with, I mean, iron oxide, zinc oxide. So clearly, energy, low energy seems to be a fairly necessary criterion for metastability, but not a sufficient one, right? There is something else that determines that a low energy phase actually can be made. It's not just its energy, right? And I'm convinced of this. I've seen now more and more examples. There are phases that are 2 milli electron volt above the ground state, and you will never make them because there are other issues with them. They are mechanically stable, but there is never a formation path to them. And this is what I want to talk very briefly about it before I end. So there has to be another criterion, right? So we have a hypothesis. And a hypothesis is a hypothesis, right? It's not a theory. It's something you put forward so that at least you can think about it and then maybe people will shoot it down. So 
We think of polymorphic metastability as what we now call remnant metastability. So polymorphic metastability means that in the broadest sense, and I'll explain what that is, the broadest sense, it was stable at another time and you just preserved it. Now the question is, what is another time? Another time is essentially the whole process you go through when you make the material. And that includes not just the classic thermodynamic parameters like temperature, pressure. We know, right, that you can make a phase at high temperature, quench it down, there's no surprise there, right? That's metastability. You can make something under pressure and often when you reach the pressure, it remains metastable. But there are other thermodynamic parameters. What about size, right? So I think of size as a thermodynamic handle as well. So maybe something is the ground state at small size, and then as it grows, it just remains metastable in that polymorph. And when you start broadening your thermodynamic space like that, you can actually start to see the origin of a lot of uh, metastability. So I want to talk about size, because why is size so important? Because size is important in nucleation, right? So we, we, know, we know a lot about size stability. The best example is TiO2, right? If you plot the enthalpy versus surface area, so small size is actually on this, act, on this side here, right? The ground state of TiO2 is rutile when you're bulk. Uh, when you increase the size, you actually get brookite, and at very small particle size, you get anatase, right? So a, a, a well-documented, both experimentally and theoretically, of how size causes polymorph crossover. When you have things like adsorption on the surface and oxidation, this gets a lot more complicated. Why is this important? Because if you think of nucleation of a material, for example, out of solution or out of another solid phases, the phase that's actually the most stable at small size may be the one that preferentially nucleates, right? Let's say this is a free energy versus size. Uh, let's say this is the stable phase, right? The green one has the lowest free energy at large size, so it's the bulk stable phase. But let's say I have something that at smaller particle size, um, at smaller particle size is lower in energy, then the system will probably actually follow the blue trajectory. And so it will, by preferential nucleation, form the metastable phase. And so that's why dependence of thermodynamics on size is kind of a key factor, I think, in understanding formation. Now, so that of course depends on the surface energy, and the surface energy uh, in, in vacuum is not really the relevant quantity. The relevant quantity is the surface energy in the environment. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. You know, maybe you're in aqueous solution, maybe you're in some gas environment, maybe you're under stress, right? Maybe you're doing epitaxial. That's a way of constraining the surface energy. So I'm going to show you a few examples. And the first one we decided to do, for better or worse, was I, I told my student, you know, we got to find um, an example where there's a lot of really good data, right? Because the first time you make a theater, you want to make sure you can really compare to the. And it turns out like everybody's worked on calcium carbonate, right? This is like the oldest problem in, in I think, the literature of ge geology, understanding why calcite, which is the equilibrium phase, does actually very often not form in seawater. You actually form aragonite. Aragonite's about two kilojoules per mole higher in energy. Uh, it actually largely precipitates in seawater. A lot of the shell of uh, shellfish is made out of aragonite. So um, the, the ocean makes metastable calcium carbonate all the time. Uh, this has implications on as, a, acidification of the ocean because the metastable polymer has, has different solubility, right? So remember, this is one of the major uh, uh, CO2 sinks in the ocean. So depending on which polymorph you form, you actually get very different CO2 release rates in the ocean. Now, unfortunately, this, this is one where experiment told us a lot. We would have never figured this out sort of by our own. So here's what's been observed, that um, the magnesium to calcium ratio in solution seems to be critical. Um, when that ratio is above two, you tend to make aragonite uh, over calcite. And today, just for reference, in seawater, the ratio of magnesium to calcium is about 5.2. So it is well over the critical ratio, which is why seawater makes mostly aragonite uh, today. Uh, we also know from experiment that calcite, <coughs> the stable phase, tends to incorporate magnesium when it precipitates out of seawater, about 7%. Aragonite does not. Uh, and that's actually quite easy to understand. And by the way, uh, geologists use uh, the formation of aragonite versus calcite as a way of dating even because the ocean tur turns out the ocean has actually changed magnesium calcium ratio a lot uh, historically. So the incorporation of magnesium uh, is easy to understand. If you look at the structure of calcite, um, 
Uh, the calcium is six-fold coordinated in calcite, and magnesium is a smaller ion, so it's okay with the six-fold coordination. If you go to aragonite, the cation is eight-fold coordinated, uh, the calcium there, and magnesium is really too small for eight-fold coordination. So you see that if you calculate the energy of incorporation, so this is the amount of magnesium uh, you put in the calcite, with aragonite, the energy shoots up with calcite, it actually only slightly increases uh, with substitution. When you calculate it, so we have ways of calculating with the aqueous solution, you find pretty good agreement uh, with experiment for calcite. So this is actually what we calculate. This is actually the amount of magnesium in the carbonate versus the concentration in solution, and this is of the scattering of experiments. So we have reasonably um, a, a, a good explanation. But that does not explain why uh, the aragonite nucleates, because from this you would actually think the opposite. You would actually think, well, you know, the magnesium goes in the calcite that lowers the energy, so therefore it should form more easily in magnesium containing seawater. Well, you know, no surprise, the surface energy turns out to be the problem. So if you calculate the surface energy of calcite uh, versus the amount of magnesium you put in, uh, first of all, for aragonite, it doesn't change because no magnesium goes in, so this is just a constant here shown for comparison. It turns out that with calcite, the surface energy hydrated, very important, the hydrated surface energy, so we put water on the surface, we saturate it with water, the hydrated surface energy actually goes up. And so now you see how the story is going to go, right? If you uh, start putting a lot of magnesium in calcite, uh, the surface energy goes up, which starts to make its nucleation more difficult, and aragonite will actually uh, nucleate. And uh, you can actually then make, a, I'll, I'll skip this, a nucleation map. This is actually the magnesium calcium ratio in solution. This is the supersaturation, right? Supersaturation of the minerals. Um, and color coded is the, the relative nucleation rate. We really cannot calculate the absolute nucleation rate. We only do the relative on a log scale. So um, what you see is that, this is from the calculation, that uh, at high magnesium to calcium ratios, you get aragonite precipitation. At low ratio, you get calcite. And then there's a regime where we basically can't see the difference, where we predict concurrent nucleation. So here's an example of polymorph selection by nucleation. And you can sort of trace it to the incorporation of something out of uh, your solution. So we have recently been looking at other problems. Can you explain other polymorphism this way? And again, we have, sti we have stuck respectably close to experiments because we really like to, this is a, 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 a this, this is thin ice on which you walk as a theorist, right, when you do nucleation. So the next one we did was pyrite. So FES2, right, the stable phase is pyrite, but it, you can, uh, in nature, often find marcasite. Marcasite is a metastable polymorph, has a more interesting band gap than pyrite. And, you know, pyrite's been looked at as a solar absorber, but marcasite would actually be uh, quite a bit more interesting. Here's what we know. Um, marcasite is found in hydrothermal vents when they are acidic, pH less than 4. Uh, pyrite tends to form when you're sort of above 6, so neutral and, and, and above. Uh, the isoelectric point of the two is different, quite different, uh, which is already telling you it probably has to do with some difference in absorption uh, on the surface. So we went after that and we essentially, again, calculate um, now uh, different absorption, so we look at all the species, right, that you can have in water, OH minus, H plus as H3O plus, uh, O2, although O2 doesn't really uh, play a role here. And what you find is essentially that uh, marcasite tends to absorb the H3, the proton essentially, with water uh, more than pyrite. And that's how it tends to become favored in the acidic region. Uh, there's, an, there's an effect of charge here, so you have to actually do these calculations carefully. They are essentially done as, uh, by joint density functionally with a charge on the surface in a sort of um, uh, dielectric medium. And here's the resulting phase diagram, if I might call it this way, right? This is pH, and again, pH sets the strength, the chemical potential of your absorbing ions, right? OH minus, H plus. Um, pH, and this is particle size, right? In some sense, this sets the scaling of the bulk to the surface energy. And what you find if you're small and acidic, marcasite is the stable phase, not pyrite. And again, this is experimentally found to be the critical nucleus radius, which is very small. You see that there's at least some plausible argument that marcasite forms as a polymorph because it's the preferred nucleus uh, in acidic uh, environment. 
We have looked at other examples. The last one I'll just uh, glance through. This one was, there was very little experimental data we were trying to understand. This is out of my own world, world of batteries where uh, people try to make lithium air batteries, but there's also people who try to do sodium air batteries. So you react sodium with oxygen and you make uh, sodium peroxide most of the time. But in some cases you make sodium superoxide. So the peroxide is N2A2 and the superoxide is Na2. And uh, just to keep a long story short, if you make peroxide, the hysteresis, this is the discharge, and this is the charge, is extremely large, which is bad, right? Because that means you're putting a lot more energy in than you get back out of the battery. If you make the superoxide, you have very small hysteresis. <coughs> and that may make some sense. Here you have a one electron transfer only. Here you have a two electron transfer. Maybe that's the reason. But we were more interested, why do you sometimes form superoxide and sometimes a peroxide? Uh, peroxide is definitely thermodynamically the stable uh, state under these conditions. And again, you can look at surface uh, energies. Uh, and again, now we do surface energies with varying degrees of oxidation on the surface. Uh, we agree well with experiments. This is the superoxide calculated. This is the superoxide in experiment, just cubic. Uh, the peroxide looks a little more interesting. And you can again make a phase diagram. This is as a function of the partial pressure of oxygen and a function of the size. And again, if you go to large so size, one atmosphere, you, you have uh, peroxide as is would be predicted by bulk thermodynamics. But what you can see is if you are small enough, below six nanometers, you actually make the superoxide. And, and what we infer from that is that people were actually working with different electrolytes in these systems, that they have a different tendency, they have a different tendency to absorb oxygen because you have to bring oxygen to the cathode. Uh, they may have a different reactivity with the surface. That, that is, is essentially what controls uh, the nucleation preference. And very exciting, uh, we thought this was never possible in lithium systems because in lithium systems the energy between the superoxide and the peroxide is much larger. Uh, there's a paper in Nature, I think, that Lily came out uh, uh, a week ago where people showed that they could actually also do it uh, for lithium and they can cycle a lithium to lithium superoxide uh, extremely well. Of course, you lower the energy density, right, because it's a one electron versus a two electron transfer, but it's a highly uh, reversible cell. So with that, I'll end. And uh, I think um, the, the points I've try been trying to make is that, you know, um, we, we are on an accelerated trajectory here, right? The, if you look forward um, and, and the way property prediction of materials is going, uh, it's by no means done, right? I don't want to give that message, but it's getting faster, it's getting better, people are developing better methods. So I've started to look at what are the next challenges, right? When you, you, you try to predict materials, we can now sometimes very quickly predict three interesting compounds with interesting properties, and then it's going to take three years in the lab to have a bunch of people work on them. And so we have started to think about you know, can you start to rationalize why some compounds can be made and some compounds uh, can be made? Uh, we have a much larger effort on this. We have an EFRC on this together with the National Renewable Energy Lab where we do really cool stuff like uh, in situ microscopy and in situ diffraction to actually look at how do phases form, what intermediates phase form. And it's a, all I can tell you, it's a fascinating world that opens up. Uh, we, we find that often, even when you make simple compounds, you go through multiple well-crystallized intermediates in between. The, the classic picture that is sort of like you, you have precursors, you have an end product, and what you first do is form a bad version of the end product, and that sort of gets better. It, it's clearly not true in many cases. So with that, I'll, I'll be happy to take uh, questions. Thank you, Gerd, and get open for questions. Martin. So you, your, your graph showing, uh, for example, the energy um, versus the actual known compounds and the ones that are theoretically predicted are still in the range of the energies one yeah. can do for them. And all the discussion up to that, presumably none of that takes into account free energy, right? So you're just looking Correct. at the internal energy. Do you think that graph and the kind of conclusions you're coming to would change if you put in the entropy and calculate the you know, it's, it's definitely going to make some change. So something we've done, right, which I've done, so we've done um, a statistical analysis where we, we perturb all the known energies by a certain delta randomly, right? So you say, I'm going to take all the energies and do plus or minus, do a, a random number between, say, plus or, or minus 20 MeV, right? Um, which is a harsh test, right, because it's saying that the energies of competing phases um, 
uh, move uncorrelated, which is most of the time actually not true. And uh, <coughs> what you find is that you definitely create a certain amount of uncertainty, but you, you always remain a high degree of metastability in the compounds. So uh, I think you make a good point that when, you know, from this analysis, I don't think we can say that a given compound, when we look at it, right, is necessarily metastable. We would have to do the free energy calculation. Um, but the statistics seem to remain valid. Do so you think the correlation between um, sort of this, this fact that some of them will be metastable and yet within the energy range of experiment, but yet still we don't see them, do you think that would still hold, roughly speaking, with entropy? Like I said, it's a hypothesis, right? It's my hypothesis. So uh, here's what happens with entropy, right? These are polymorphs, right? Uh, they actually, if you think of what entropy they have, there's not a lot in play, right? A lot of them are fairly stoichiometric. So it's very, the configurational entropy is quite small. Um, the vibrational entropy, even though it's large, what we know is that it's, um, uh, it cancels out to a large extent in compounds with the same composition. It doesn't fully cancel out, right? But there's a lot of, entrop there's a lot of entropy calculation when we look at polymorphism. It's slightly more troubling when you look against phase separation, right? Because now you're comparing things with different compositions where often the bonding is different, right? I mean, I'll take you in a crazy extreme, right? Let's say I make an oxide, and that's unstable with respect to the metal and the oxygen. I mean, it normally isn't that I'm making up a crazy. That would be a terrible case for our analysis, right? Because, you know, I've made now a metal uh, that's sort of semi-soft, let's say, right? I've made oxygen where I have very high entropy, and now I've made something in with very low entropy, right? So that would be a, a, a tough case for this comparison. Now, there are very few like that, right? They're usually metastable. Like, you know, if you take a ternary oxide, right? They're almost, if they're metastable, they're usually metastable with respect to the binary oxides with the same valence state. So that's why there's a lot of cancellation uh, going on. Yes, uh, thank you. It's a beautiful talk. I have a question uh, regarding, you mentioned uh, the polymorphism between uh, calcite and aragonite. So... Uh, I think they want me to repeat the question. Yeah. I was checking if they yes, can ask questions. Yes, yes. yeah. Or use the microphone, please. Yeah, the problem is that they only have one microphone, so I think I'm going to try to repeat the question. Yeah. yeah, that was discussed in the beginning that I forgot. I have to repeat the question. So sorry for the interruption. Okay. So you mentioned the polymorphism between uh, calcite, uh, calcite and aragonite, and there is a lot of controversy about the nucleation pathway for um, amorphous calcium carbonate and the, the situations where you will have a classical pathway yeah. to calcium and so on. So my question is, have you looked at this problem or could you get some insights from this simulation? So the question is specifically about calcium carbonate, where um, there's a lot of observations that, for example, there are um, amorphous polymorphs, there's vaderite that comes up, and then you form. Um, so we are working on that theory. I actually think that a lot of these observations that have been made where it's claimed that classical nucleation right. theory is not applicable, uh, I don't agree with that assessment. Um, I, uh, you can actually do classical nucleation theory on multiple simultaneous polymorphs, right? And what you will get is a kind of uh, redissolution uh, re reprecipitation. Right. So, um, if you actually, so, so there's a puzzle still in carbonate, in the calcium carbonate, right? So you only get nucleation with extremely high supersaturation. And in my opinion, that's what the precursor phases do, right? You have precursor phase, intermediate phase that form, they redissolve, and that gives you temporary, very high supersaturation. You know, again, at this point, that's sort of a hypothesis, right? But that's how we see these other phases fit in. I don't see them as transforming sequentially. Uh, Oleg, also if there is a question from Zurich, uh, go ahead. Oleg. So, in your talk you discussed many properties, uh, re really many. I would assume some of them would come from experiments, from, from some from theory, but it wasn't always clear, like for this uh, substitution probabilities, I mean, for this uh, uh, checkerboard table. Uh, uh, so, <coughs> to, to what extent do you actually rely? What was the ratio of, uh, of, of data, let's say, that comes from experiments and from theory that you are using in, in doing whatever predictions? So, so the question was about how do we rationalize when we use experimental data versus uh, computer data. Um, I, I, I mean, we have no membership in any club, really, right? So we use whatever is available and, um, and, and actually well curated. Right? This is important. Um, and for example, it also depends what you need. 
to get the substitution algorithms right, we wanted to use experimental data, right? Because we want to know what phases have been observed for what chemistry. So there it makes sense to, to use uh, experiments. Another case where we use experimental data is um, uh, a part that I didn't talk about. Um, we have worked on equilibria with solutions, aqueous solutions, right? And aqueous solutions, you can calculate ions in solutions. Actually, Nicole has done a lot of work on that. But it's hard, right? It's time consuming. It's, it's hard. And you have substantial error. So we use their experimental thermodynamic data for dissolution of ions. And we combine that with ab initio computed data for the solid state. And if you do careful reference state issues, this is all perfectly valid, right? So we actually integrate data when it's feasible. It's not always feasible. So it's not like we have um, a mantra like we should always use this or that. We use no, but whatever. If you, if you now look back at all the completed projects and successes, to what extent you used experimental data and to what uh, computed first principles, I mean, let's say. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that's just hard to separate, right? Like, okay, sometimes we <laughs> like work on a compound. The structure is predicted through the experimental data mining algorithm, but then all of the properties are calculated through uh, ab initio methods, right? Okay. Francesco? Hey, good. great talk. Very thought-provoking, as usual. I, I have more of a philosophical comment. So, you know, if you compare organic and inorganic, right? Your curve for organic will be flat because everything is metastable. Uh, against oxygen, everything is metastable, sure. right? Uh, so one thing in, in organic, though, is that not only compounds are more than the 200,000, but also chemical methods are incredibly more, right? Yep. So if you look from the organic uh, you know, point of view, you know, inorganic chemists have five syntheses. Yep. And they, and they, you know, mix and match the five synthesis, yeah. but, yeah. Uh, you know, this is what an organic first-year student learns in the first week, right? Yeah. So, the fact that you predict another 10 phases of TiO2, doesn't it call, not for saying what's, what's available now with the current method, but to develop new uh, inorganic synthesis approaches, right? For example, shouldn't people look more on how to stabilize small clusters, and seed them and to make them grow. Which in a sense is what people starting from all these others on are doing with this, you know, all these key uh, substitution of nanocrystals so they, they get new faces all the time. Yeah. No, I, I, that's a great comment. I'll just paraphrase it for yeah. you. That, you know, so in, 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 organic, chemis in organic chemistry, right, uh, I'm in awe of organic chemistry, right? I mean, there, there really are sort of unit processes sure. of doing substitutions and creating certain reactions. And a lot of people fall back to, they know exactly how to substitute a given hydrogen on the ring by something else. And, and, uh, and I mean, all because you can hire somebody out of graduate school, right? Or not even out of graduate school and make, them make a complicated molecule and they'll write out a reaction path. Uh, today, we do not have the equivalent for inorganic chemistry, right? Um, I think that the, the more time we're spending with this problem, I think we are starting to see unit processes. I think they have not, maybe not been verbalized and extracted. You know, there, there are, you know, there are clearly sort of the, the one where you have nucleation preferences, right? There are things where you have sort of topotactic exchanges, right? You make something, hydroxides to alkali, metal oxide is a great example. You make a layered hydroxide precursor, you do a soft chemistry treatment, proton goes out, alkali goes in, right? So, and the more time we're spending, I think we're not going to find more than sort of 20 unit processes. But, but you make a good point, right? If we start going to clusters and combine clusters, then I think it becomes a continuum that, that's really interesting, right? If you make a small cluster of something and then you start putting them together, can you induce metastability like that way, which is, a, I think, a fascinating problem, right? Great. I think on this so moment. Maybe we have a question from Sue? Absolutely. <coughs> we can hear Great. Uh, you. Great. Uh, reported an impressive success story, but a known method works in all the cases. So have you ever faced something uh, which turned out to be a failure? So there was some prediction which never worked in practice, and you had to do it or something like that. What's the success ratio so far? So good. So you know, it depends how you define success, right? So at one point, we had a large lithium battery discovery program. And at one point, I reported the, 
the success ratio defined as say we had an idea for a compound, we went in the lab and we tried to make it, we had an over 50% success ratio, which I thought was really good actually. Like these were totally novel compounds, right? So the problem there is of course like when you cannot make something, you don't really know why, right? That's the problem. So you can't easily analyze the failure um, and actually say, uh, you know, it's because some piece of theory is wrong. It could also just be that the student wasn't creative enough, right? Or, or it simply can be made. Um, I'm trying to think now how many... The student, the student of course, it's the student, right? It's the student, of course, right? Didn't work hard enough. Not 27 hours a day. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of failures of the theory that were sort of non-obvious, right? Because of course we know that band gaps are somewhat wrong and so, um, you know, I gotta say that it's a tough one, right? Because, so I'll give you some examples. So we, we work on ionic conductors. Uh, these are fast lithium ion conductors where we have definitely predicted some phases are fast lithium ion conductors and when we make them, they're not. Now, it's really hard to, to analyze that, right? Because they always have a, they have a small amount of impurity phase. You're not sure that if you get rid of that, that you might not be a fast ion conductor. Um, you sometimes can't carry or dope it. So it's, very, it's sometimes very hard to analyze whether the failures are theory failures or you haven't quite made what you should make. As you said, uh, defects and kinetics. This one? <laughs> Defects, kinetics, yeah. and you know, I'm only joking, right? Defects and kinetics are very important, but, but they often don't they explain something when people bring that up, right? It's more an excuse. Guys, I think there is an after all waiting for us downstairs or so. Thanks again, Jeff, for the very talk.